Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for making the time to uh, join us this afternoon. And so I, if everybody's ready, I'm going to kick off our launch and learn about the fractional or board or advisory role placements. My name is Alexandra Satine, and I am the co-founder of your cohort. We are a fractional C-suite leadership team that help deliver growth and profitability to our portfolio clients. And I am super honored to be here. Thank you so much to She's Independent, to the leadership team, and particularly to Natalie for this opportunity. And I will actually hand it off to you. I know you had a few things you wanted to share. Sure. Thanks so much. So we are thrilled to finally be launching this. I just want to mention a few things. We are investing at the core of what we do, but we're really big on access and education and recognizing that the funding gap is one of the gaps as are the power gaps that exist, you know, representation, having more women on boards in these executive roles. And so when we invest, we're not just saying, here's a check, but we're saying, what are you doing in terms of representation? What have you done in terms of investment and culture? We sometimes invest in teams of white men. I will say that, but we will only do it if they are adding women, if they are adding diversity to that business, to the executive team and to the board. Prime example, I'm going to bring it up right now, Uma, who's on this call, made an introduction into a business, tremendous business, they lacked representation, and they told us how important it was for them. They not only took an investment from She's Independent, but Uma is now on that board. Uma is incredible, you'll hear from her today. But we love leaning into and investing in these women-run businesses, but we're also another force to say, what are you doing for getting women into these really important and significant roles? So through She's Independent, it's not only about getting on the cap table, meaning becoming an investor, but it's also about stepping into those other power positions. So really excited to partner with Alex, who has all this great expertise and experience. I will also say, as a reminder, if you have not filled out that intake member onboarding survey with She's Independent that says, I am interested in these roles, this is my background, and we'll talk about that, but that's how you actively get placed. So I guess with that, back to Alex, um, I guess one final thought, we are not a static database. As investors, we're always having conversations with these founders and businesses. So we're really uncovering real opportunity. All right. I could talk all day, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. So before I start the presentation, I'm going to give you a quickly uh, agenda for this whole one hour. I'm going to walk you through what is the process, what you can expect, how does this opportunity work? And then we're going to switch it to our incredible panel of experts that have been doing either a fractional role or a board role, or actually both at the same time. They will tell us about their experiences and what they've uncovered as they've gone through this journey. Please don't hesitate to ask any kind of questions throughout the entire presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. Just um, if you have one, I think you can raise your um, your Zoom hand. And, um, and then we can talk about it. So I'll pick it up, let's go. So when She's Independent and your cohort came together, we thought that it was an incredible opportunity to match the talent and the experience that our members at She's Independent had with the needs that the founders are constantly bringing to also to She's Independent. So we ultimately wanted to be able to have a greater impact than it wasn't just the financial investment that we do, but also the human capital that we can provide to these founders to help them grow uh, and uh, ultimately get to their next round or uh, their exit. As we are going, um, oh, sorry, let me, my slides, okay. As we are onboarding and we are getting this program kicked off, uh, one of the things that is going to happen is that the interest from our members is incredibly high and as founders start to bring their needs, there might be a situation where we have higher demand from the member side to get into these opportunities versus how many opportunities are coming through the pipeline. So we're currently in the process of kicking off both sides of the opportunity. Any questions? I wanna pause there before I go into the process. No? Okay, great. So what does this process look like? Well, we first, uh, when you enroll to She's Independent, like Natalie just previously mentioned, you have to fill out a form where we really capture a lot of the data that we will need for the match, matching process. So we capture your experience, your industry, your interests, your uh, bandwidth, 
all of that. If you haven't filled out that form, definitely, definitely, uh, I will be sending up a follow-up email where we will provide that link, but make sure you fill that out so that we can take you into consideration when the opportunities do arise. Founders are constantly coming to either Natalie, Kristen, myself, and they bring a need that they have. Once we have that need, we gather, I, I'm the one who gathers all the skills that is required, the timing, uh, when they need it, um, if it is in person or not. I take that information and then I go back to our members that are interested in this placement and I try to match the skills and all the qualifications that the founder is looking for. Once we find the matches, I then reach out to the members and let them know of the opportunity. After I reach out to them, and if they're interested in the opportunity, then I will introduce them to the founders. And through the entire process, pretty much you can rely on myself to jump on a call. If you have questions or email me, I'm in constant contact with the founders and they're telling me, giving me the feedback until we ultimately close uh, the opportunity, whether it's for a board, again, fractional or advisory role because this is the biggest part of the project. Does anybody have questions around how the placement works? I guess quickly, I think it's worth, oh, Jennifer has a question, but I just want to say Alex at, Co, you know, she's one of the founders at Cohort and she's been doing this for years. And so I think what's really interesting about partnering with Alex is there's a lot of nuance to, you know, not saying, oh, you're taking this candidate, but kind of that dating and that matching phase and that understanding and really digging into what are those gaps and, you know, how might these placements work? So there's definitely some human elements and massaging that happens on top of that scalability of the data and the matching. Um, so just a shout out that Alex has been doing this already for years. And if you have questions uh, throughout, again, throughout the process, please don't hesitate to ask me. Um, I see some familiar faces that I'm actually talking to right now. Uh, but Alyssa, if you have a question, how can I help you? Hi. So first of all, this is amazing. I didn't know this existed when I, I joined and I was very excited when I got the survey. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a way for us to also know, like almost the language that these founders are using to describe what they need. Because I know, I don't know if anyone else is in my position, but as a business owner who works with founders primarily, I'm always trying to figure out how do I match? Like the way I talk about what I do might not be the way they talk about what they need. So how do I bridge that gap? So I would love to know as you start getting more of these matches and more founders reaching out, looking for placements, you know, how do they, how do they talk about their needs for each category? Sorry, I'm like in a hotel room trying to uh, juggle my computer. <laughs> Don't worry. I know you were trying to make it because you wrote me. I made it. So yes. It's great. <laughs> so it's great that you made it. And no, it's a very good question. Um, honestly, I've really narrowed down the questions. I don't leave it as broad for them because sometimes they just give me a lot of information that is not what I need in order to find the right match. So I've created a series of questions that has really helped me to do that. I call it a discovery call. And so I really ask them like, how many hours you're going to need? What uh, expectations do you have from this person? Is this person managing a team? Is this person going to help you hire a team? Do you want this person to only come for a project? Uh, what expertise are you looking for? If you're looking for FinTech, is there a particular tool you want them to have knowledge for? Uh, do you want them to have a particular type of network? So I start asking certain questions that ultimately matches back to the forms of the members that I have. So I go back and look at, I also check their LinkedIn. I also, if, if I'm not sure, I will write you an email and be like, hey, this, uh, actually there was that example a couple months ago. The, this one founder wanted this one particular tool. And I knew that there were a few members and she's independent who had that industry expert, but I didn't know who had the knowledge tool. And so I asked them and two of them did. So that's a perfect example when it comes down to something very granular. Uh, I really try to have that conversation. That's why there's a, quite a bit sometimes of that back and forth at the beginning before I ultimately say, okay, you guys should meet. Yeah. That level of detail and thought is amazing. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, you all go, I, I, I try, I really try because <laughs> I've had my lessons and learns. <laughs> Any other yeah, questions? Question? Yeah, I had a yeah, question, I had a but I think you answered it. Uh, my question was whether the founders have access to profile or, you know, um, LinkedIn 
LinkedIn bio or of you know whatever of the the candidates. But it sounds like a you know they talk with you, they speak with you, and then you you try to extract information as much as possible, and then you try to match you know. Yeah, folks, and I know uh, so that description. I also and then I think Jennifer, I think you and I were exchanging an email this week. I, I'll ask for your blurb. I think that's very key. And by the way, in general, everybody should have a blurb. Even when I do an introduction that has nothing to do with it, it's good to always provide the person who's doing an intro your own blurb of how you want to be sold. So I usually ask for a blurb and then I put your LinkedIn uh, contact in there also. So make sure your LinkedIn is up to date because uh, I have run into that issue where people don't have their LinkedIn up to date and that actually is not beneficial because everybody looks at their LinkedIn, by the way. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. So I will keep moving along. So what um, opportunities we're going to be working with? Again, we're working with a fractional, an advisor opportunity or a board member opportunity. A fractional is, in some industries, they call it still a consultant. So it's someone who is more involved with the day-to-day -day business. Their level of hours might be uh, on a higher end. Uh, they could be looking at one-year uh, contracts or more project-based, which can be a few months. An advisor is someone that is more an expert in a certain field or in a certain role, and they're there just for a few hours, giving more like a strategical, more bird's eye view um, uh, advice to the founders. <clears throat> and then you have the board members who are more uh, overseeing the company strategy and overseeing the management of the business. Any questions in regards to the different opportunities that are coming our way? No? Okay, great. So with that said, I'm going to start uh, our conversation with our incredible group of panelists on this. Natalie, if there's anything else you want to share before we move on to the panelist side? No, I think it's great. Um, I would say just to kind of supplement what you've already covered in the slides, there is a FAQ on the Notion uh, member playbook um, page, which we will link to. And so don't feel like you need to get everything answered today, but we want to make sure that, you know, we are getting things answered and you up to speed so that um, you can start plugging into the opportunities. And the only other thing I'll say before we start with, the, uh, with our great panelists is that there are opportunities coming through She's Independent. At times, I might reach out to you from your cohort because we have a pretty big group of portfolio clients that we work with. Sometimes my clients need some of the talent that you guys have. So I have reached out uh, in the past to She's Independent members to see if they're interested in your cohort opportunities that come the way. So it goes both ways. Definitely, uh, Natalie and I saw that as the opportunity that we can collaborate that way. So if I do reach out to you and if, if it's for your cohort, I'll let you know like, hey, this is a founder that we actually support and I'll walk you through um, our process. So definitely there's that opportunity. Um, okay, great. So I am going to introduce you to our great group of panelists. Uh, and I'll let them give you a little bit of background to their journey and who they are. So we have Anne Bibb, uh, who is part of your cohort. Then we have Natalie Levy, which uh, she's from She's Independent, Ali Stenka, and Uma Gopaldas, which they're all from She's Independent. So I'll kick it up with Anne, if you want to do a little bit of an intro. You know, I'm just looking at that, Alex, and realizing I don't have my co-founder of co your cohort in my bio. I need to fix that. What is wrong? How did we not catch that? Um, <laughs> I'm sitting here going, why? Um, but hi, everyone. So happy to be here. Um, I have been in the fractional space for a very long time as well, uh, typically in the fractional COO, CXO space. Um, tying in the EX and CX area, uh, do a lot of M&A work, working with startups, uh, typically the area of as uh, companies that are at that end stage startup going into the mid market, helping them uh, transition from that area, and then helping organizations go global. So uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Natalie, I'll let you. Sure. I'll do a, a real quick one. Um, I, in addition to investing and, you know, leading She's Independent, 
have spent years doing some fractional advisory and executive work. I'm also a board director. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to incorporate this into what we do with investments. My background is primarily in the uh, tech space or the corporate space in enterprise SaaS um, and B2B sales. And I would say I've really translated that and my financial knowledge into roles that, you know, aligned with that. And my focus in terms of, you know, business I've worked with, it, they've mainly been under 5 million, you know, in terms of ARR or recurring revenue, but one off it's been, you know, 10 to 15 or 20 million um, and really excited to, you know, partner and, and work with bigger companies as well. But primarily I'm focused on She's Independent. Great. Ali? Yes. Hi. It's so nice to, to chat with everyone. I am a brand strategist slash fractional CMO. I know that can mean a million different things. So just to quickly define it in my terms, brand strategy is the discovery the organization and the prioritization of your story. And when we get into amplification in the many ways of marketing, that's when that fractional CMO comes in. Um, I am a journalist turned PR person turned strategist. I've worked with every type of startup under the sun. I always like to give the example because it's just so absurd um, that I launched an on-demand drone liability insurance app in 2015, which could not be more 2015. Um, and basically what I do is work with brands who recognize that most of the time the agencies aren't the right fit for them. Um, so try to figure out whether it's myself or bring on a team or in a fractional CMO role, um, really all types of businesses. Um, and I've been doing this work for a couple of years now. And Uma. Hi everyone, nice to be here. So my background is oil and gas, uh, gold mining, and then now I'm in energy. So I like to say that I used to be digging black gold and then I was a gold digger. And now I'm digging out energy. I'm trying to dig my soul out of the ground after being in those industries. Um, so um, today what I do is I have a company called Leading Lotus, which is all about governance with the great heart and soul founders who are doing the right thing. Social impact investments, which is how I met Natalie. She's amazing, uh, amazing company. Um, and so I sit in a couple of boardrooms for energy transition companies. One is a startup, which is amazing. The founders are amazing. We'll talk about that later. Um, and the other one is a big energy, energy transition company. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. Oh, I am going to stop sharing my screen. So that way we have all of us in the room. If you want to call it that. Great. Uh, so let's start the conversation. I'm really curious um, and I'm very excited to hear about how did you start your journey? How did you get to a board seat or a fractional role, an advisory role? And um, Ali, if you want to kick off and tell us a little bit about how you got there, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. My, my path was an interesting one because I feel like it was a little bit of a push rather than a pull and that I was at an agency that I just recognized was not the right fit for me and looked around and realized I was actually basically fractional CMOing already. Um, I just need, didn't need the emotional support of the agency behind me. Um, so told myself that I could try it for six months and let's see what happened. And um, I, it worked, which is, which is good. So I know that that first leap is hard. So I sometimes joke with folks that for me, it was pretty easy because I knew I was leaving the place that I, that I currently was. It's kind of funny with me. It was, it, it was similar, but a little different in that I realized I was doing something for one company and that if I kind of took a step back and did kind of started my own thing, I could help so many different organizations. So not having that tie in and being tied to a corporate over overlord, um, <laughs> then I could actually help multiple by doing this fractional bit. And there was such a, just this overwhelming sense of being able to, you know, happiness and joy and being able to one, be my boss and to help multiple organizations at the same time. So I, I feel that, Allie. And, and I might jump in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I might add to to what you know was just said, which was flexibility of or you know having control over schedule. I do not want to glamorize the fact that you might be on call or you might have to do more work than you were expecting or you know ramp maybe you know something transitions are tough. But for me, I was going through a big life event where, you know, we'd gone through a lot of loss and I wanted to kind of dip my toes in. And frankly, I was like, I'm not taking a full-time thing. And so it ended up being a, 
I could find the space and the time, you know, go on that hike or, you know, do something for health or take the nap I needed um, and not feel like I had to do the nine to five or frankly, much longer days as I have done in my finance and sales sales days. Um, and knowing that, you know, when, when I wasn't on the clock or when, you know, I wasn't needed for that project, I could really just like completely be away from it. I'm not, you know, doing everything to close that deal because I'm more of an advisor. I'm more strategy. So I think that's a really important call out, Natalie, because there are, and, and, and not to glamorize it, but to set that realistic tone that there are going to be weeks as a fractional that you're working 12 hour days because you have a project due, but there are also going to be weeks that you're working 10 hour weeks and you get to go to the beach or you know what you can work from anywhere and you can go to Italy and take a call. Um, so there is that flexibility that you build your life around your job and you're, you're working to live and not living to work. And it is a huge transition that helps your mental health. Uma, yeah. how, Uma how did you get into yours? Bought, oh my God, that journey is, so you gotta, um, you gotta figure out that uh, seven, I mean, we still have only about 30, 20% representation in boardrooms, the most powerful rooms in the world, right? So when I was, I have 30 years of corporate energy, oil and gas, and big company names in my background. But there was always, I was dying of a million pricks uh, to my heart because I was always <laughs> challenged about ethics and values, but had to execute on big stage uh, strategies, but you always came down from the boardrooms. But, you know, the main thing that we, I learned was as women, we suffer from imposter syndrome so easily when we are trying to do the right thing and gain that leadership uh, position so we can access the ability to drive strategy, but we could never uh, get into that position. So I had to leave 30 years behind, jump into my own company, just lock, stock, barrel, blind, and say, it's all going to work out. And then as soon as I, I've always understood that boardrooms were powerful. So I had to battle my own fears about how do I sit among 70, 80 year old, average aged white men <laughs> who came from Ivy League schools and thought that's the only way to run the business. And so you got to deal with your own internal personal conflicts. Uh, that's one of the best thing that we did or I did with and Natalie did was uh, ACE uh, board a certification, which really spoke to how we can transcend that mental uh, limitations. Once I broke through that and within my own company, I converted myself to a governance, called my company Leading Lotus, which sound, like I was telling the lady sounds like a spa. But the Lotus is such a beautiful feminine energy, yet a very powerful energy that can come out of the bog of mess of all this business data. So, you know, once I shifted my mindset, that's it. I got on two, three boards, just like that, boom, 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 in 2022. Now I sit among most powerful men who call me up and say, I respect you for your knowledge, for your immense capability to be who you are. So that's mm -hmm. my journey. I love that. And I just have to weigh, weigh in on one more thing, which is writing checks to get in the boardroom, it's real. And so she's an appendant as an example, right? When we write that check, we can be influential to say, and we want a board seat. And, you know, it's better when the checks are bigger and we're getting there, but still we're influential on the, we want a seat at that table. So one of the investments we, we made last year, uh, John Kelly's company, some of you know his name, oh, Sarah. Yes. Um, I think we're going to get a board seat or either way, you know, I know that there's fractional, you know, advisory uh, work that may align well. So I just checked in with them the other day. I'll make an intro, you know, to Alex, but being the money and, and, and having influence and saying, oh, I wrote a check. You're also learning so much about these businesses. And there are sometimes reasons, you know, Uma mentioned, you know, being independent and, and maybe not wanting to be, you know, an equity owner. There are different reasons for that. But as investors, we are influential in that process to get placed in those roles. And it elevates yeah. as an individual as well. Absolutely. And um, I don't take equity just so I can remain independent. But after two, three years of term, they will give me the equity at the back end because yeah. I want to keep the, in, as a founder uh, and investors involved, you want to have one independent person in the company I that Natalie actually invested in. And that's how I got a seat as an independent board is 
they if you want to go to series a b and everything you want someone who's already independent in the board and and by the way that comment there most of the people have skin in the game so most of the people in the boardroom are investors the independent board seat it's something else not to get too crazy we can mention this in the fact but being an investor is not a bad thing because you have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders and so being an investor and a shareholder it really aligns me <laughs> you know <laughs> So I guess unlike Uma, I like being um, an investor when I'm when I'm also on the board. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. Uh, I want to go to the next question because I know that there's a lot more wisdom to share. Uh, I would love to start with what have been some of those challenges as you've started in this journey, and. Uh, Maybe Uma, you can start with yours and you sort of went into it as that was more your personal kind of had to move, get past that confidence and that issues of how you were perceiving yourself into getting to these board seats. What were other challenges that you saw along the way or how did you overcome those or how would you advise other people going into a board seat uh, as a challenge that they can see? The biggest one and the only one that really mattered was it's part of the imposter syndrome, but the way you market yourself, the way you brand yourself, it is who you are, your essence. So never be sorry for who you are. And what I learned while I was in a corporate gig was I had to become someone else to fit into a corporate agenda. Whereas when I feed myself, I needed to rebrand myself. And then I was still using the old school of oh, I'm this, I'm that, but you know, I'm so humble, but so I'm not going to tell you more about everything I did. So when I went through my own LinkedIn and, you know, understanding through the ACE board program, again, they were like, you got to shout about your achievements. Men do it all the time. So if you look at my LinkedIn today, I brag, which is not me. I'm, which is not most women, right? I mean, and then we are taught by our mothers, be humble, be docile, <laughs> like, oh God. So I don't even recognize myself in my in those things because we do these things naturally. We just do it without the accolades, right? Because we are happy doing a lot of the achievements that uh, men take for granted and they are like, oh yeah, okay, it's part of the gig. Uh, so watch your LinkedIn, go in there. If you don't know how to make it bling, go to my LinkedIn and pick up pieces of ideas, you know, most of the time we talk about the tasks. We never say we've led, we've delivered, we've punched through this and stuff like that. So that's my advice to everyone. That's a great one. And if I may, yeah, sure. If I may jump in on Uma's rather than share my own, um, I work with a lot of business leaders who are starting their own consultancies or newer, newer, you know, startup founders and things like that. And what you're talking about is a conversation I have with every single woman I work with. Um, I will work with consultants who are newer to doing the work and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I have a side hustle. I'm like, no, you are a CEO of this company and you've accomplished this. And it is so hard to be introspective on the things that we do that are amazing, right? Um, so I, I suggest figure out the way that if you, like Uma, need to figure out exactly what you're so special at, ask your best friend, ask your work best friend, ask your partner. What are the things that I, what's my superpower? And it's uncomfortable as it is to go talk about that. That becomes your LinkedIn headline. Um, so if I may just jump in with my challenge, mine has been, knowing the value of that thing and charging for it, right? So when I do brand strategy work, um, it can get lumped in a little bit in this PR, very commoditized, things like that. So I say, no, this is a really valuable exercise, right? If I come up with this exercise that unlocks something for you in 15 minutes, you're not paying for 15 minutes of my time, you're paying for 10 plus years of building brand and that way, and asking the right question to, to you know unlock that thing for you. So it's something I deal with every day. I stopped myself um, before standing a scope yesterday and bumped up the fee about 25%. Um, so I'd say as you're figuring out your pricing, we want to get that foot in the door and um, often undercut ourselves. So I'd offer there's no risk in going a little bit higher. And if you're consistently striking out, maybe you're not pricing correctly, right? But I think exactly like Uma's saying, it's a marketing thing, right? If you're going in and talking about your tactics, it's you're not valuing your work. And actually, and that's a great... 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. I was going to say, and I encourage everybody to have their 60 second pitch. Like picture yourself in an elevator next to somebody that you, and, and I run a speaking class where um, people will come in and they'll be about to uh, do a presentation in front of somebody, we have some authors that are doing their big book pitches, things like that. And the first thing that I'll, I'll ask everybody is what is your 60 second pitch? And if they can't do that, then that's an issue. So practice your 60 second pitch. If you want to run through that, let one of us know. We've all we've all had to practice it. It is awkward, awkward, mm -hmm. I tell you, because trying to sell yourself as a woman the first time you're doing it is hard, but you can do it. Figure mm -hmm. out what your special thing is and what you're passionate about and what you what you're trying to sell. You're selling yourself. Yeah. Alex, I know, you, I know you want to move on, but just one quick thing on, you know, mindset. It's so big. Um, and imposter syndrome, by the way, I just read this really interesting article in the New Yorker and it was developed by what it was. It was studies around, you know, white women 50 years ago um, or more. And when you look at the updated research, let's remind ourselves syndrome makes it the, the person and there are different ways to lack confidence where it's not always the same the same thing when you start looking at broader and, and more diverse studies. Um, and so I really want to second and say, you know, the, the thing that Uma mentioned about us having to unpack and remind ourselves, I've got this, these are the skills. Sometimes, let's just say maybe you're a woman who looks a little bit different than, you know, the men who've already been doing it. They may, um, you know, have a low bar for you and you realize wait, it's not even imposter syndrome. It's just how do I really show up as myself and authentically and, you know, in a way that's not their version of what they need, but in a more powerful way as a Lotus, let's say. Um, but I, I just wanted to kind of unpack that for a second. And I think as somebody who's on boards, on paid boards today, I sometimes am in the boardroom and I have to remind myself, even in the moment, I'm like, oh, well, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have that background. I'm like, wait, I have the finance background. I've done all these deals. I have opinions. And these are really, you know, that I'm here for a reason and I earned it. I still have to sometimes remind myself and unpack it, even though I'm landing the role. So do not feel bad if, you know, for years you you continue to unpack and say, yes, I'm a woman and I'm strong and, you know, all these things work and my feminine side or, you know, this other thing that I understand about human interaction or connection can be as powerful as or more powerful than that guy who went to Wharton who just did, you know, the same thing that everyone else did. Yeah, I know. It's very true. And I think I, I share everybody's um, thoughts on this, especially because I've had to navigate a little bit of what Uma says and definitely with Ali and, and branding yourself. So, and the 60 second pitch for that is actually a must have also along with your introduction blurb. I think those two and your LinkedIn. So I think you have that and you're ready to go. So Ali actually mentioned something that is uh, was relevant to my next question is, how do you price your work? How do you price it, whether it's on an equity side, on a cash side? How do you guys work through your pricing and, and what that work is worth? And so I, I would love to kick it off uh, with Anne. Anne, how have you gone through that exercise? I know I've had 80,000 different ways of doing it. So I'm interested in knowing how you've done it. You just cut out on my side, Alex. How have I done what? The pricing. Okay, so pricing, uh, you're, I've done 80,000 different ways also. And I think it comes down to <laughs> what I'm trying to accomplish, what my client is looking for. So there are a couple of, um, when I'm sitting down with my client and I'm looking at, is it a project? right? Is this is something that has a finite beginning and end? Uh, if that is what I'm looking at, then I'm going to do a project base. Now, if I'm looking at that, then when I am putting that together, I'm looking at a very clear scope and a very clear view of that contract because scope creep is real whenever you're looking at these projects. And you got to make sure that whenever you're looking at that pricing, that you're factoring in your your time, your deliverables, um, any kind of 
things that you're utilizing, for instance, if you're doing a training and you want to use Kahoot to deliver that training, um, then that is going to cost you something. So you've got to factor all of that in. There are some great calculators that help you do that if you don't want to do it manually, but that is one way. Another way is your time, right? You can do an hourly based. So if this is something that's going to do, they only want to do an hourly. Um, but what I also do there is I have a minimum. So if you want to do a, an hourly uh, retainer for me, you have to at a minimum agree that I am going to be on your uh, uh, at a minimum uh, 15 hours a month. So that's going to be a minimum pay of X dollars per month for me, whether you use that 15 hours per month or not. So I'm guaranteed that X thousand dollars per month. So there's those two or those, those are the two main types of deals that I do. There are several other different kinds of pricing, but it really comes down to which one works best for my client, which one works best for me. Um, because of how I structure my contracts, um, they keep coming back. Um, I have a master service agreement, and then we just keep doing SOWs under each one. So it makes it, I try and make it as simple for my clients as possible when it comes to that. And um, whether they want to do a, an hourly for one or a project based for another, we just work through each of those. No, that's that's actually great. I've I've had to figure both out, um, and I've tried a few different things. I'm curious though, from um, Uma on the equity side, how have you navigated that? Uh, and I know it's a little bit different when it comes to yeah. boards. Boards also yeah. do get paid, but I'm just yeah. So the when when it comes to board compensation. If it's a large cap, mid cap, it's fine. It's defined by the industry, right? So that's all out there that's researched. Um, when it comes to startups, when it comes to series A funded, B funded, it gets very nebulous. Um, so what you want, well, what I do is because it's basically my time. And as soon as you have a startup with an equity package involved in it, you have to have more time involved as a board director. Whereas a mid cap and large cap and small cap, they're very well defined. You turn up four times for the quarterly review and you walk away, unless if there's a special project like an MA or a, a new exec uh, hire. But so for a startup, you I have to be very nuanced in how much time am I going to be spending with this company? What skill sets do they need from me? What research do they want from me? From there, I'll start negotiating. The ones that I really like because of their social impact, they are the impact that they're creating. The founders have great heart and soul, great capacity to think uh, entrepreneurially. Um, I, I manage the equity from anywhere from two to 5% as an independent board. So I don't, I mean like not independent now, I think I'm taking equity uh, to plus a compensation because of the level of work. For those that can't afford it, but I know I've done my due diligence that they're gonna go big and we can seal big time investors. I don't I don't take any a compensation. I just take an equity at a higher end, maybe seven to ten percent. So it really depends on how the startups are structured because some of the startups are ESOP. So they have uh, an option pool that I can pull some uh, stuff out of. So very different. And I got a really it has to speak to my heart. Right. So and how the founders are, then I can navigate that. That's a that's a really good point, Uma. And I completely forgot about the equity. And and I've done that for some projects for some startups as well, where I've taken anywhere from 0.5 to to three percent of equity with either no salary or uh, reduced salary. So again, it just depends on the the organization. I have to jump in real quick because um, I'm I'm a numbers person and, and I love the compensation discussion. But if you're looking for a calculation for the hourly, I mean, one back of the envelope you could think about is if this is your first time and you haven't put a number out there, what were you making, you know, all in comp, you know, with bonus and everything. And then roughly what was that hourly rate? Again, if you looked at your full-time thing and you can like come up with something. And again, that's a ballpark. If you're never hearing no, you're not asking for enough. I mean, that's a given. Um, but when you're thinking about 
working, you know, maybe they need you a few hours a month, let's say for some, you know, advisory role, it's going to be more than a few hours or bake in things like emails or correspondence, you know, not just you doing the thing. And by the way, if I'm doing strategic work and it only takes me a few hours a month, but it's my expertise of 20 years of this or that charge for it. Right. Yeah. I want to get no's sometimes when I quote, and maybe it's a little bit different because Alex is here and we're here to kind of guide you and, and give you some of that, you know, influence and, and some of that, you know, the, the data and the backing, but you don't want to undercharge and you don't want to realize, wow, you know, I price so low and like, I'm doing all these extra things. Like you want to feel good about it. And if I'm pricing for equity, I'm not just going to take a piece and say, oh, great. I have 2% or 1% or whatever it is. I'm actually going to do the calculation to be like, what is the valuation today? And again, that's a conversation. It's where exactly. the cash comes, right? And then I can look at what is that hourly based on, you know, what do I get? And then do I get more equity, you know? And, and so technically when I'm, when I'm looking at those rates and whatnot, if they're paying me cash, it's called cash is king, right? That's the statement, meaning that's money I have today. If it's equity and I'm just going to throw out rates, let's just say I'm 250 an hour cash making this up. I might demand, you know, five, 50 or, you know, 500 or so for equity, meaning because that's not money in my pocket, I might charge that kind of higher hourly. And again, they're not going to think of hourly, but you can think of it and calculate based on what that equity package would look like. Um, so anyway, sorry, just some, some quick. No, that's, that's great. So Alex just put the calculator that I was referring to in the I chat. Love that Thank you, Alex. I, so, I wish I had known about it two years ago when I started. Oh. I know. And it's it. But Natalie makes a really good point, because there was a time that I was undercharging and I was like, I'm the bomb. I have so many clients. I can't keep up with them all. And this is great. Well, you know why I had so many clients? Because I was freaking undercharging and they were getting a great deal. And like but once I realized that I was undercharging and I realized and I kind of right sided myself, I had the same amount of money and actually the right amount of time in my day. And it just kind of all balanced out. And then I could actually refer clients to people that could do the business. So I'm like, here, Alex, you know, this is, I can't do this one because I don't have time. And would you like this one? So it's just, it all works out. There is enough business to go around, take care of yourself and then take care of others. Absolutely. And you know, what's yeah. funny, a quick note here. Um, I sit on investor councils for a research firm called uh, GLG, uh, German Lehman, huge global New York based. Uh, their rate, initial rate for me, of, so I'm in the investor council for investors for putting money in gold EFTs and gold mining companies and gold as well. So huge strategy decisions I sit with big name invest, uh, institutional investors. I was charging $150 an hour by GLG US. I did the same thing for GLG Australia. They came back and said, oh my God, you're charging so little. I'm going to increase your pay to $350 an hour instead of $150. And now they bumped it up to $500 an hour. So sometimes you need to get your value from the professionals themselves are telling you, why are you undercharging? <laughs> so that's, that's what I learned. I also have a different pricing for it, depending on how much the founder raised. So that's always one of my questions. And I definitely think that should be one of your questions when you're talking, it's like, how much have you raised? Because if they raise 10 million, that's very different from 1 million, right? Or even half yeah. a million. You can't, uh, you can't charge the person who just raised a million the same that you would with someone who's raised 10 million. So I always ask that question. And I also ask like, what's your sort of runway or when did you raise that? Because then I can do the math of where they're probably are in their cash situation. Yeah. And also knowing if they're gonna be able to pay me for how long. Yeah. So, so one, one other thing I'll offer, which is more on the art of pricing than the science, but everyone, if they don't have this immediately top of mind, should get, should get a piece of paper and write down green, yellow, red of your services. What can I do with my eyes closed? What do I love? I'm so good at, this is so easy. I can hop on a call in five minutes and not think about it. Yellow is like, I can do it. Maybe it's a little stressful. It's something I'm stretching into, but it requires a little bit more emotional energy there. Red is, I do not want to do this. Like someone has to pay me so much money to do this thing. And I offer that because when you're negotiating, which you inevitably will, if something is really easy to you and you're like, ah, maybe I can do this. It's actually pretty easy. I wasn't actually going to kind of use all of that at uh, the hourly rate. Maybe you're a little bit more willing to stretch into it. 
men otherwise. So you don't, you know, whether you put it on paper or whatever, whatever it might be in your scope of work, is this something that I can do super, super easily and doesn't require a lot of stress? Or maybe it's a skill set that I need to learn, which I better be charging full price for because it's going to take more of my time. Okay. Um, before I ask the last question, does anybody in the audience have any questions about anything that we've brought to the table? I would love to get your thoughts or be able to support you in any way possible. No questions? Jackie has one. Jackie. Jackie. Sorry, Go for it, Jackie. Um, I just had a, a comment, just um, I do things a little bit differently because I also do a lot of advisory roles and fractional stuff. And I tend to kind of like paint a rough picture of how I can charge on these different levers like equity, you know, hourly or retainer and commission for what I do because a lot of times I'm doing business development. And a lot of times I like to have them kind of give me an offer. And that also gives me data rather than me putting together some big proposal and wasting my time. I say, you know, let me know based on these levers and what you're wanting me to help you with, um, what your, you know, what your offer would be. And then from there, we kind of have a negotiation and back out. And so sometimes I'll say, well, if you can only afford this much in retainer, I can give you this many hours. So that's because I'm pretty flexible with my business, but that works for me personally. One, and I've one final comment to um, follow on, and I love that. We're running a negotiation discussion next week. It's a free event. And um, having them throw a first number is great, unless they throw a bad one, in which case you need to rip it out because of the bias where it pulls and anchors to that initial number. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about negotiating next week if you have any interest. Or sorry, the 27th, so two weeks. Well, one other thing on the theory and the kind of pricing strategy, if I may, is I also find similar to Jackie, my work is super flexible. So what I do is I offer when I think that there's really a lot of flexibility with their scope, I offer a totally high, high number, a kind of a lower floor number. And then I'm expecting they're going to come in some, somewhere in the middle. Right. But then the nice thing I find is incredibly helpful. If they go come in the middle or the lower end, then you can say, you did not get this service because you're not paying for it. So there's no question of scope creep because scope creep, they have agreed to that. Um, and then they, they feel like they're getting a deal, right? If they, you're going to end up at seven, they, you, they saw 20, they feel like they're getting a good price. Um, anybody else have any questions or anything they want to add from their own experience if you're already in the space? I guess one one other thing I'll say because it is really um, lacking transparency, you know, board comp um, compensation. I am actually running a survey and some analysis right now on some private company data, and so I'm going to share that as well with the group. I think it's you know by learning about you know being an investor, or thinking about valuations. I mean, it starts to allow you to say what am I looking for with the company. There's honestly so many data points. It's like there's no right or wrong, but it's to even get to the ballpark of, or, you know, feel confident in something it takes, you know, real experience, but um, data helps. And so it's uh, really lacking transparency. There are databases out there, but honestly, I've never seen a good one, but I'm getting live updated data from a bunch of women who are on boards. And so that's something I'll share with you, Alex. Well, um, I'll ask one last question and then we will wrap it up. Um, my one question that maybe all of you can answer in a quickly like one minute answer is what is the one lesson that you would want to share with these women that are looking to go into either a board role or what is that one keep in mind top lesson uh and i'll start with ali Sure. So as you guys can probably tell, I'm, I'm a big fan of exercises and, and, you know, doing the work to figure out what to do. And my, what one of the things that I found most helpful when I was starting is I challenged myself to make an exhaustive list of everyone I needed to informally tell about starting my business, friends, coworkers, things like that. And then people I needed to formally pitch. And I found that once I was, and it was scary, right? You're like, how do I start this? I was halfway through the list and I realized I was, I was full. Um, and what I'll do is when I'm maybe a little worried about something, I revisit that list and I force myself to go through the exercise of that check-in moment. It'll just remind you of how many people you actually know. Um, and it's really easy to reach out and say, hey, you know, I've actually been doing this and I haven't needed to do a formal biz dev process. So can we talk about who you might have in your network, right? You're doing a biz dev process, but you're framing it um, in a different way. So 
I find just also then you're when you're freaked out and you feel like you you don't have any work coming in next month, you look at that list and you realize you have that. So um, we're all surrounded by by people. Great. And I, I would say very similar, build your network and build your brand. Just make sure that you're constantly going. Um, and also don't just think about the vertical network, right? That horizontal network is so important uh, because one of the things that we're constantly leaning on is each other. Because when I have too much, I'm reaching out to Allie. Um, when Allie has too much, she's reaching out to Natalie. And if I have something that I come up and I'm like, I'm not, a, I'm a CX expert. I'm an operations expert, but I'm not a marketing person. So who do I know that I can reach out to that I can pull in on this contract that is marketing? Oh, look, there's Allie, you know? So it is so important to have this massive network of consultants that you can pull in as fractionals on these deals. So just network, 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 have your people next to you. And by the way, the for the placement, I mean, Alex is this powerhouse of, you know, kind of helping with this ecosystem. And so I love that. And it's, yeah, I, I, this is not for me. I, it's not going to be a fit. I don't have the time, whatever it is, or I don't have the expertise, Alex, great, go play somebody, you know? And so I think having that mechanism, um, whether it's, you know, people you already know, or working with Alex is really tremendous. But if you really want to move into this space um, or, you know, land your first board role, I just have to say, if you're thinking about it and you're like, this sounds interesting, or I think I want to do that. I'm just going to say, do it every time, right? Try it step in. If you're like, I think I might be qualified or I want to wait a little bit to try for that board role. I'm going to urge you and, and kind of say, why wait? You know, even if it's a small startup that you initially step into a board role with to get the experience or a nonprofit or whatever it is, you know, don't wait. When, when I hear, oh, well, I, I need to get this skill first, or I need that experience first. No, you probably don't, or you can get the experience with a company that is really going to value you. And maybe they're just earlier in their journey. But I think with a lot of women, it's, you know, waiting until, and it's like, well, it's never easy to transition, but if you're interested and you're asking those questions, I think you should already be doing it. Well, I'm saying it again louder for the people in the back, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Breen, you had a question? Yeah. So, um, I have been, so my background is I'm an investor. So I was an investor in equities um, in the tech media telecom sector. And uh, we use GLG. <laughs> um, and now I do more um, consulting, et cetera. But I've been told by um, a dear friend who works at a big executive headhunting company that I will not ever be on a board or anything like that, because my experience is incredibly general. I didn't go through corporate and I don't have a very specific skill. You know, like I'm, I'm an investor. I'm very um, generalist. Yes. Yeah, so I want you to write stop. that down on a piece of paper. No, write, <laughs> write those words. You will not ever be on a board down on a piece of paper. I, I want you to write, just <laughs> roll it up. Just like talk, and then I want you to throw it away, and then it's gone because that was BS. What they just told you. Yeah, definitely. I, you know what? I I'll tell you something, and I think one of the reasons why I love what Natalie's doing, you you can do whatever you want to put your head and your energy in. Just just do it. Just don't put excuses. Don't let other people put their insecurities on you. Don't let other people tell, put guardrails in how you want to do your life. Do it. And if you end up doing it and it happens and you like it, then, you know, you just changed your life. And if you don't, then it was an experience and you can move on to the next one. But I I'll tell you this. I, I originally went to art school. I am not from this country. I migrated in my 20s. And I've gone on a crazy wild journey being in this country and I learned English late and the whole nine years. You can do whatever you want. Don't ever let anyone put their insecurities in you. Wait, real quick, since we're getting to the hour, even though I know there's one more that's going to answer. 
Can we do a group photo? I would love to share this. <laughs> How do you do that? I can do like a <laughs> screenshot. If okay, we do my reactions. Reactions. Reaction. Hey, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. If anybody wants to come on video, I'll um I'll do a little countdown. But no, no, no. Bryn, you can reach out to me, and I I would love to chat with you. Let's love it. Man. I'll do that. Right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a countdown. Oh yes, look at all that. I love that coming on video. Look at that. All right. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Three, two, one. Smile. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't blink. <laughs> well, thank if I also may just end on a super like two second thing, just say that someone said it before, but I think that there's also this deal of like, how am I going to do it? I have never felt more supported by fellow consultants than, than doing this work. You will feel more supported than coworkers. So if you have no idea where to start, just ask people, be like, how do I do this? And you'll, there's work. There's a lot of work to be had. I don't think we heard it from Uma for that last one, right? Oh, yeah. Just one thing. (laughs) So um, a lot of people think that boredom is hard to get into. I can tell you it's not about getting into it. It's about you wanting to get into it. So before I was in your position saying I didn't have, I have the generalist background. I ran a lot of stuff, but maybe I'm not the right person. It's not that. If anybody tells you that, it's bull. Um, so today, after being able to land into boardrooms easily and having a pipeline of uh, people wanting me to be in their boardrooms, yeah, it's just over two years, by the way, just happened over two years. So it's all your mindset is today I can choose the type of boardrooms I want to be in. The cultural fit has to be absolutely talking to me. It's not about me trying to fit their culture. They have to fit into who I am. Uh, and and how I want to uh, function with values. So today I call myself semi-retired. I don't even call myself a board uh, board member because that's truthfully, I only work one quarter of my life in boardrooms and I go volunteer in schools, which Natalie absolutely wants me to stop and do more important no, things. No, no, no. Thank you so much for free, Uma. I said we need to spread to you and all don't these do it for free, yes, yes. Not one okay. classroom, all the classrooms. Yeah. <laughs> I volunteer in the elementary school with special needs kids, which makes me feel so uh, rewarding, uh, rewarded. So, yeah. Thank you so much to everybody who joined and to our incredible panelists. We really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you, you know, uh, be part of my network and also be in place, placing you. So uh, thank you so much. And yeah. If you have any questions, I will send an email with a lot of information, the presentation, the links, the video and everything. So you will get a nice package uh, at the end of this week. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.